Today, we're gonna to go through seven different types of investments to help you understand exactly what these investments are, the pros and cons for each, and to give you stronger confidence in being able to invest in these yourself. So, let's jump in. Hi, my name is James Corsier, and welcome to the Money Paradox podcast. Yes, that is right. Uh, we're gonna be talking through seven different types of investments. So you can understand better what these are and what really makes them up, how they differ to each other, right? So, so you can get a better handle around them and invest in them yourself if it fits your situation. So the first one, stocks and shares. So that is basically uh, each company out there has the ability to uh, list their company on what we call the stock market. Not uh, every company can do it, there's certain requirements and so on, um, and that's too much for, for, this, for this video, but essentially a company can list its company on a stock market, and by doing that it allows anybody to buy a piece of that company. And when you buy that piece of company on the stock market, you have a share in that company. So if that company goes up in value, you make money. If the value of that company goes down, you lose money. Okay, super simple. And you can invest in like one particular company, or you can invest in uh, a bucket of different companies, a collection of companies. So for example, you can invest in Apple, right? get a piece of Apple, and if Apple's value goes up, you make money. Or you can invest in say, the FTSE 100. Now the FTSE 100 is essentially the highest, the top, the, the, the top 100 valued companies on the UK stock market. That's literally it, or the London stock market, hence um, it's on the London Stock Exchange. The S&P 500, that is essentially the, the 500 highest value um, companies in the US stock market, okay? And so there's different types of what we call indexes. So an index is essentially a whole load of companies that you pull together and you say, well, what's the, the value of all of those together? And so um, it kind of represents the market. So if the S&P 500 goes up, then we generally say that the US stock market has gone up, okay? So you can invest in that whole market as a whole. Now this is powerful because you're not reliant on that one company, right? If you invest in Apple and tomorrow there's a big um, new scandal, okay, and Apple's value drops, then you get screwed over, okay? But if the, 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 the stock market as a whole is doing well, in fact it's going up, then you, know, you have lost money when the market has gone up. Whereas if you wanna just invest in the stock market, then you can invest in something like the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100, right, uh, within the UK. Now, the stock market, uh, a few things to kind of talk through. Generally speaking, it's considered to be the highest, uh, highest returning asset group out there. Asset is just simply, simply something that you can put your money into that you expect would go up uh, in value over time. And, uh, and that's generally the case. The stock market has performed very well. You know, if you take the last 100 years, it's, it's got about 9, 10% um, return, annual return. If you look at, you know, the last 40 years, you know, it's even better. It's kind of like 13, 14% really, really high returns. So a very powerful area to invest your money. Now, the trouble with the stock market is it is very volatile, right? You know, we looked at 2007, uh, 2008, not that long ago, uh, the stock market dropped in half uh, within the US stock market and many other stock markets out there. If you look at 2002, 2003, again, the US stock market halved and many other markets, huge, huge drops. So if you invested in the wrong time, you would lose a lot of money. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, I want to invest my money, but you know, I could do with it in a year or two because of that wedding because uh, of that uh, big uh, adventure trip I want to do, then the stock market might not be such a good idea because if you catch it at the wrong time, you might make a big drop. And, you know, I'm writing this video in 2019 when the stock market is very high. It has gone through one of its longest bull runs ever, you know, um, very, very high returning, and many people are talking about a crash. Now, I'm not saying a crash will come uh, or very soon, and that is certainly a topic for another video, but... But if, you, uh, but if it does happen, and this is when you invest, and you're wanting to pull your money out in a year or two, 
you're not in a very good situation, are you? And um, so the stock market is, is, is particularly powerful when you're investing in what I call the long, long term. If you're investing in kind of over 10 years, ideally like kind of 15, 20 years plus, then the stock market is, is reliably very good. Now, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, right? History doesn't always uh, predict the future, but uh, with something like the stock market, we have a huge history to go by, right? I mean, the stock market has been around for, for, for centuries, and uh, you know, if you look at over, even over the last 100 years, you know, it's a long time, then the stock market has still done very well, right? Uh, so yes, the future might, might hold a different story, uh, but you would be really going against what has happened for a very long time. Okay, so bear that in mind. Now, uh, if you take something like 2007, if you invested in 2007, okay, and then you took your money out in, say, 2017, then you would be taking your money out at the same price, essentially, as 2007. So for 10 years, you've made nothing. And in fact, on because of inflation, you've lost money over 10 years. How insane is that, right? So... So the stock market really, really can pr produce great results, but it can also can produce really negative results over the kind of short term. And even over the medium term to kind of long term, it can still produce kind of a very poor results or even still negative results, right? It's only in the long, long term that it has generally proved to be um, reliably uh, powerful in getting strong returns, okay? So... That is the stock market. Okay, second one, property. So property is a uh, super popular one, uh, generally because many uh, very famous people have become successful in property. It's very accessible. It's very hands-on. People can relate to it because everybody kind of needs to live in a property, right? Um, everybody's heard of a success story around property, whether it's their family, on TV, you know, online. Yeah, property is kind of everywhere, right? We see it everywhere, right? So, so it's understandable that it is a po popular area to invest in. I love property. I invest in a lot of property. I do very well in property, um, and I and I advocate it. I recommend it to people. But this is a big but. Not for everyone, right? Property comes with a whole load of um, kind of pros and cons with it and implications, right? If you're investing in a property directly then it's an area that requires you know, a certain level of skill. And there's different levels of how you can invest in. But there's a lot that goes on within property, right? A lot of things can go wrong. And you're buying something that has a very high price, a very high value that you're buying it for. So if something goes wrong, you make a mistake, you could lose a lot of money. You know, thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds just on one property if you make uh, the, uh, you know, the not the right kind of mistake, but uh, certain kinds of mistakes, okay? And I've seen this, I've seen this with people I know, and I've been very close to it myself, right? So be warned, right? Property is a really, really great area to invest in, but it doesn't um, come without its risks, okay? But also it's work. You know, you can't just go out and buy a property. You need to research that property, you need to understand the area, you need to understand the industry, you need to understand the tax implications, yes, Tax. I know I said it again, tax. I know you all love tax just as much as I love tax. Um, but yes, property has a lot of very specific rules around tax. And if you don't know them, okay, and then you you make certain types of investments, you could hit be hit really badly. Certainly in the last few years within the UK, a lot of tax changes have come in, which mean that property um, is a lot less profitable, a lot less beneficial in certain situations because of tax. Yes, you're right, tax. I know, your most popular area. Um, so so bear that in mind, okay? You, you kind of need to know what you're doing, right? And uh, certainly uh, to the level of the type of property investing you can do, okay? Um, within property, there's loads of different types of uh, ways you can invest. You can buy a property, you could, um, you could, you could commit to renting it and uh, pay a guaranteed rent to somebody else. You could find a property deal and sell that. Uh, you could buy a property, uh, fix it up, sell it for a higher value. You could buy it, hold it, 
rent it out um, for the long term, for a year, loads of different things you can do with property. I love it, I think it's a great subject, but you know, you need to understand the area, okay, if you're gonna invest in it, and you need to appreciate the risks, and you need to be careful of those risks, because some of these risks can, uh, can create big losses, all right? Now, you don't actually have to buy properties yourself or do a kind of hands-on to invest in property. Uh, there's these things called REITs, real estate, I think, investment trusts. Uh, but essentially, you, it's a it's kind of like a, the stock market, but for property. So you're investing in a, a particular fund, for example, that within this fund has a load of properties in it. Okay, so you buy a piece of that fund, you buy a piece of those properties, right? So if you feel that, say, the UK stock market, uh, stock market the UK property market is going to do well over the next few years right what you could do is you could buy a fund buy kind of a portfolio buy a piece of a fund that has a load of UK properties in so that if those properties go up then the value of that fund goes up and then you the, the bit that you own will go up in value and you make money okay so you don't actually have to do it yourself hands-on um, you can invest in something that is um, much simpler effectively okay now there's a whole load of things i could talk to you about property i love property there's um there's there's lots going on at the moment um, and and ha- uh, around uh, brexit around um around uh, around kind of uh, what, what do i want to say um there's a lot going on within property uh, at the moment because market changes are affecting this important area. Certain areas are doing really well, other areas are doing not so well, we're actually going down in a lot of value. So again, a key thing with property is that no area is the same, okay? If you invested in, say, within the UK, London versus uh, Liverpool versus Aberdeen versus Edinburgh, those areas are performing completely different to each other, okay? And there's uh, very specific reasons for why those areas are doing well or not so well, okay? So the area you invest is, uh, is particularly important. Same with countries, right? What's going on in the US versus the UK? Completely different economic situation uh, and how and how that is impacting the property market. Again, uh, fundamentally very different, okay? So be mindful of that, okay? It's about location as well, not just about <coughs> the area uh, in general. All right, so that's property. Next one is gold, right? So gold is essentially a store of wealth, right? So, I mean, it used to be used as a currency and, you know, many uh, currencies were backed against the gold, right? But, uh, but now it's kind of a, a store of wealth. It's, some, it's an alternative to putting your money uh, uh, compared to cash, for example. Now, there, there has some functions for it, like jewelry, and in certain kind of uh, machinery and things. Um, but the, the f- how to explain it, the value of gold relative to the value of its like functional use is, is, is quite different. The value of it is much higher than its functional use. And that's because we've inflated the value due to its view, due to the market's view of its store of wealth. Okay, so that's a very complicated way of saying, effectively the value is derived by people's um, view of its of its um, benefit of storing uh, value okay so for example if if the market is not doing very well and people are worried and the economy is going to go down or um, inflation is going to go up so the value of cash is going to go down right then what people will do is they will they will seek what we call a safe haven something that is safe that shouldn't um, be affected by value um, in these uncertain times or these or these uh, difficult times. So often people move money into gold. And so when we move money into gold, what happens is the demand for gold goes up relative to the supply of gold that's out there. And so that demand versus supply means the price of gold goes up. So effectively, if we shift to that situation, the value of gold goes up, okay? So the value is it's kind of like demand supply based effectively. Uh, the other way is around the supply of gold. Re- one of the reasons why gold is so popular for a store of wealth is that there's a limited amount out there, right? So we're still mining gold out in the out in the world, right, in different locations. But it increasingly becomes more and more difficult to find it 
because there's only so much gold out in the world, okay? So if you have a bit of gold, then you have a bit of like a finite resource. Does that make sense? You can't just, you can't create gold out of, out of nowhere, right? You have to find it from the ground or you have to take it from somewhere else that is already using that gold, okay? So, so if all of a sudden somebody discovers a huge amount of gold under the earth and they're starting to mine it up, okay? And if it's substantial enough, the supply goes up relative to demand and therefore the value of gold goes down all right so generally speaking it is a good thing in, in certain times when people feel that the economy is doing poorly or it's um, there's high inflation so the value of cash is going down over time more people will move into gold generally to uh, to store into something that feels safe and that will push the value of gold up okay so that's a general concept so it's a good thing as a kind of almost like a diversification uh, like a hedge something to protect yourself against something else you're investing that's doing well when the economy is doing uh, that does that does well when the economy is doing well right stock market goes up when the economy is doing well gold uh, kind of doesn't necessarily do so well right but if the economy does bad stock market drops but gold can go up in value right so it's kind of like um, protection against one going down or up all right so that's gold fourth one bonds right so you've got different types of bonds you've got government bonds you've got corporate bonds so let's jump let's kind of explain that so government bonds are affected a bond is um is a loan right it's a piece of paper that says i owe you i owe you some money in the future plus a bit more money because you've been really nice and you've lent me this money effectively right uh, i don't know why you use the word bond it you know it's really confusing for a lot of people that don't invest or are not uh, super experienced in this area but a bond is just a piece of paper that's kind of like an IOU, just like a loan. So a government bond, if you if you um, have a government bond, it's like you've lent money to the government and the government is giving you a piece of paper saying, thank you very much for lending us this money. We're going to give you that money back um, in the future. Plus, we're going to give you some more money because you've been really nice um, and lent us the money effectively. And that's your interest, your return. Okay, so government bonds... Uh, is that corporate bonds is effectively the same but for a company okay so you could go to apple say say oh you know here's 10 grand right uh, borrow 10 grand off me and then you know in a few years time give me it back plus give me some interest okay and then apple will say yep sure give me the 10 grand they give you a piece of paper saying i owe you this money plus a bit more on top right government corporate bonds and then you have long term short term so Effectively, it's a loan, but you can have a loan that happens over months or years or 10 years, 100 years, right? Uh, and so um, so the bond value, the kind of, what are the key things to talk about here? Okay, so firstly is uh, what makes up the return on that bond, okay? So there's two, there's two things that, that, that you can benefit from owning a bond. One is that... Uh, the government will say, right, okay, I want to, I want, uh, lend me some money, and in the future, I'm going to pay you that money back plus some interest. Okay, now, you you make a benefit from that interest, right? That's a bit on top for the money you've lent, but it kind of comes down to risk because if if you're lending it to say the UK government, right, or the US government, then it's like extremely unlikely that that government is not going to give you that money back. Okay. You know, what's the likelihood that the UK or the US government is just going to like just not give you it back, renege on giving you that that money back? It's possible, could happen, but if that happened, then it would have to be in some really really difficult circumstances. It's never well, has it never happened? Well, certainly, um, if it has happened under extremely rare circumstances, that that has happened, right? So, uh, what to say here? If you're borrowing, if you're lending the money to someone that is extremely unlikely to pay to, to not pay you back, then the return is going to be very low because the risk associated with that is very low. Okay, so bear that in mind. So if you want a better return, you might want to lend to a perceived riskier um, government or company, right? So if a company is struggling, or uh, you're lending it to a, a government that is particularly struggling, or the economy is do, not, not doing so well 
then what it will do is it will offer a higher return to convince people to lend them money because without that higher return, it's not worth taking that risk on, okay? But for you to get that higher return, you're obviously taking that high risk. So you need to be mindful of that. The other thing you can benefit from is the increase or decrease of the value of that bond. So I don't know. So for example, let's say I, um, I lend some money to the government and they say, right, uh, in 10 years, you'll get this, uh, your money back, plus you'll get 5% interest uh, per year, okay, on your money, all, all uh, from, from, from the money you've lent me. Now, okay, great, so they've issued me that bond. Now, let's say a year later, uh, they are doing, um, they're doing much better, right? They don't need to lend the money so much. Um, people are much more willing to lend the money because... Uh, that's what they want to invest in. So instead of offering 5%, actually now they just want to offer 3%. Because at 3%, they can get more than enough people to lend them money. And um, and they don't need it so much, right? So now the market, okay, sorry, the government is offering 3% bonds. And I've got a 5% bond. So my bond is worth more than the bonds that are currently being issued out there. So the value of my bond now has gone up in value because people want my bond more than they want these other bonds because they're producing a less return. So if the, it's kind of confusing, right? But if the, the, the return that bonds are offering in the future go down, the value of the bond that you already have goes up, okay? So that's the other way you can benefit. So you could buy the bond um, from the government, say now, 10 year bond, and then like in five years time, still got five years left, you could sell that bond for higher value uh, than what you originally paid for it. Okay, make sense? That's simply it. Okay, next one. All right, a bit more rogue, a bit more kind of re relevant to what's going on at the moment. Cryptocurrencies. Okay, so cryptocurrencies is essentially, it's investing in, uh, it's kind of like a, oh God, how to explain this really simply. Um, it's effect, oh, I, I want to be careful not to say the wrong thing here, but effectively you're um, buying, it's kind of like a digital asset. And there's a whole load of debates over what it is. Is it an asset? Is it a currency? What is it? Well, generally speaking, if you take Bitcoin, which is the most famous one, Bitcoin is generally considered to be, at the moment at least, an asset rather than a currency. And that's because it's quite expensive to transact in. Um, the, the volatility of the price changes hugely. So it's difficult to, to, to buy and sell with, right? So if you're buying, if you get paid in Bitcoin, um, you might get paid a thousand pounds of Bitcoin. And then, you know, in a week's time, it might be worth 700 pounds or 800 pounds or 1500 pounds, right? And so then the amount of money, the amount of things you can buy with that, with those Bitcoin vary hugely. So it becomes, not a good way to to receive money and then to buy things with okay people people do at the moment um, but it's still quite niche because of that issue and then the third one it's a bit complicated to handle right it's um it's slow to transact you've got to go on various um specific uh places to to get those that currency to change it right so it's a bit problematic to, to get hold of and, and to sell and to buy and so on. Okay, can do, okay, but you kind of need to know what you're doing. So cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency is, the reason why I put it in here is that one, it's topical, but two, you know, what I call it, the way I'd classify this as it's, uh, it's kind of a wild card bet. You're investing in it, you would invest in it, if you thought it was gonna go up in value in the future, right? So now the first thing to kind of say here is it's extremely volatile. It has gone up a huge amount since its inception, okay? So if you invested in the first few years it had um, come on board, then you would have made a huge amount of money, right? If you sold today. So that is very captivating to a lot of people. Like, oh, if I invest in Bitcoin, I could make all this money like so many people have done already, okay? Sounds uh, very enticing, so I can make these huge amounts of money in a very short period of time. And yeah, you could, but just because that happened in the past doesn't mean it's gonna happen in the future. You've gotta think 
why would it go up in, in, in value? Now, there's a lot of reasons to say that it would go up in value um, and maybe even a huge amount. But there's a lot of reasons to say it will go down in value, in fact, to, you know, almost to zero potentially. Okay. So the thing with uh, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, you know, we'll use that example, is that there's a lot of things that can make it go up in value a lot and a lot of things that can make it go down in value a lot. Okay. So when you have huge volatility in something and a lot of different factors that can make it go up or down depending on certain situations, um, then it's a dangerous thing to invest a lot of your money in. Right? So if you were to invest in it, it's, uh, it's, you know, these wild, it's what I call a wild card bet. You know, if you go to invest in something like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally, you only want to be investing a small amount of the overall amount of money that you want to invest with. I would say personally, maximum 5% on all of your wildcard bets, okay? So you don't wanna be spending a huge portion of the money you wanna be investing in within something like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, if you do. Now, my personal view is I've, I've invested in cryptocurrency and I've, and I've done well from it, okay? But, okay, I do not invest a huge amount of money from it because tomorrow I could lose it all, right? And so you've always got to think, you know, am I willing to lose all of the money I've invested in this particular asset uh, with these types of assets? If that's a yes, then invest the money. If not, then don't, okay, don't. It's also not a good uh, type of investment to invest in when you're just starting out on the world of investing. The way I look at it is it's like you've got different levels. It's like foundational, you know, just like if you see my logo, that's one of the reasons why I use that logo is... Um, the whole subject of money and wealth and uh, financial education and investing uh, as well is it's foundational. You start with the simple, reliable, the things that work, right? And then you build up to the more advanced levels um, if you have the appetite and as you become more experienced, more knowledgeable in the areas. With something like cryptocurrency, because uh, there's many things that can make you up and down in value in a huge amount, then you want to be careful in something like that and you need to know what you're doing. So, you know, if you've invested in cryptocurrency or you're thinking about investing in cryptocurrency and I were to sit down with you and ask you some questions about what a cryptocurrency is, um, uh, how it works, why it's popular, um, under what circumstances would it go up or down in value, right? If you would struggle to answer those questions, then I would say you should be challenging whether you want to invest in that area. You always want to know what you're investing in. Because if you don't, what will happen is something will come up in the future, right? Like, for example, it might go down in value, okay? And if it goes down in value um, abruptly and you don't really understand what it is or why it's happening, why that thing is happening, then it's going to feel very emotionally destabilizing you're going to think well, what's going on why has it gone down in value should i should i sell um uh, you know um you're, you're not really going to know how to deal with it and it's going to affect you quite considerably but if you generally understand that subject then when something happens in the future it goes up or down then you've got a better under you've got a better um likelihood of being under being able to understand why that's happened and then also be able to handle that change okay Right? Make sense? All right, good. And then the last thing is it's a kind of longevity. So when you're investing, you've got to think like, why am I investing in something? You know, um, if, I, if I think that cryptocurrency is going to do well in the next like short period of time, then, well, how much is that going to benefit me in terms of the long term, right? In terms of my long term ambitions around investing. All right. So that's all I'll say about investing in cryptocurrency. All right, next one, commodities. So commodities is essentially the, the kind of like raw materials, raw things that people use or companies use in the economy. So like foods, for example, like grain or oats or rice, copper, iron, you know, metals, for example, things that are like input materials into the production of the economy and goods and products and services and so on, right? Oil, for example, is a commodity. And this uh, is an area that doesn't necessarily go to generally go up in value over time. OK, so it's not necessarily something you want to invest in as a kind of a general bet of 
increasing the value of your money over time. But it's quite good as a hedge, as something that might do well when other things don't do so well. So hmm, what is a good example of that? So let me think. Um, okay, so when, the, when, it, when inflation is going up, right, so the value of your money is devaluing, all right, then commodities is quite a good thing to invest in because if you think about it, when, when inflation is high, what that means is the things that you can buy with your money are becoming more expensive. Well, what are those things? Well, one of those things is commodities, right? So commodity, it means that it's likely that commodities have gone up in value as well, okay? So if you're hedging against inflation, then inflation going up, then commodities is a good thing to buy, all right? Uh, another way is around uh, if the economy is going up. So if the economy is doing well, right? Um, you know, people are buying more things, consumption is going up, then what happens is companies are producing more. And because they're producing more, they need more input goods, right? They need more oil to transport stuff, to produce things. They need more metal to make things, more grain to feed animals, to feed people, all that stuff, right? Well, what happens? The demand's gone up, so then the price of those things go up. Demand is supplied, right? If demand goes up, then then uh, people, more people are competing for those same commodities, and so the value is going to go up, or the price is going to go up accordingly, right? All right, last one. This is kind of um, kind of an asset, but it's more like a, a type, of, a way of investing, and that's peer-to-peer -peer lending. I thought I'd bring this one up because, you know, it's quite popular now. You see it a lot, uh, certainly online. Um, you know, people are kind of talking about it a lot more. Peer-to-peer -peer lending is simply... Peer-to-peer -peer means like person-to-person, -person, right? So traditionally, if I wanted to uh, borrow some money, right, to set up a company, right, for example, then I'd go to a bank and I'd say, well, bank, can I borrow £10,000 and invest in my company? And the bank would be like, yes or no, this is the interest rate and so on. Now, that's good because the bank is providing that service, but um, it's very reliant on whether that bank is going to allow you to, right? And that bank has all these strict rules, and it's um, it's 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 quite conservative, and um, you know they're not necessarily going to want to understand all the various nuances of your business, okay? Or they might just not be wanting to invest their money in that particular area, okay? So for a whole host of reasons, it might be difficult if you're just relying on banks. Introducing peer-to-peer -peer lending. So peer-to-peer -peer lending is person to person. So you could borrow instead from a bank from another person or the other way around you could invest in another person so another person wants to set up a company you could invest in that other person right so effectively it's instead of going through a big financial intermediary like a bank you're going like person to person and as this area is matured there's many more options uh, out there that you can do peer-to-peer -peer lending with so you could just go specifically to a particular person that's wanting to create a company, for example, and then invest in that person. Or you could invest in a whole collection. So a company might pull together 100 different people investing in 100 different companies, okay, that they've assessed, that believe is, you know, have a certain level of um, risk and, you know, a um, certain level of kind of sound financials around those companies. And then you can invest in that uh, in that kind of fund of a hundred personal businesses, right? So it's still peer to peer lending, but it's kind of like one to a hundred, one to many, for example. Okay, so this is a popular area because it it opens up um, a whole kind of another kind of field in which you can invest it, and there's different areas you can do it in. For for example, in property in companies, in just general personal loans, right? So for example, you know, if you go to say uh, Zopa or Ratesetter as an example, that they are companies that do just standard loans to people, right? And then what they're doing is they're going to other people and saying, well, will you, will you um, lend um, us money, okay? And we'll give you a certain rate and then we'll lend it on. So instead of a bank hold, like holding, holding that, it's Zopa, 
or rate setter is doing that instead. And the, the reason why it's kind of peer to peer is that it's it's a pass on. It's more of a pass on, right? It, property as well. So you could have different companies going to a peer to peer property lending company and saying, "Look, I've got this company. I want to invest in it to 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 turn it around to make it more valuable. Uh, lend me some money, okay?" And then what they'll do is they'll facilitate getting other people who want to invest money to get a good return. And then we'll say, for example, pick that person and invest the money directly. Okay, so a lot of companies out there uh, do your research. The, the key thing around this is, one, it's, it's quite new, not super new, but it's only been around a few years. So it, it's still to a certain extent an immature market, right? The other thing is that you know, if you lend money to a bank, then it's safe to a certain extent because if that bank falls over, then the government backs, certainly in the UK, backs up to a certain amount of money, the money you've invested in that bank. Okay. Now there's a whole kind of debate around, you know, um, could you still lose the money? Could the whole government collapse? But in those circumstances, you'll have much bigger worries, right? So just generally speaking, you know, if you invest in a bank with the uh, with the fact that that money is assured by by the UK government, it's very very safe. Whereas if you're investing in a peer-to-peer -peer lending company, you don't have those same uh, levels of assurance, right? So you always want to be really careful about the risks around that. And there's different risks. So, for example, you've got the, the company risk, right? Or what we call the platform risk. So you might be investing in a really reliable company that um, through the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. But if that whole platform, that whole company that's providing that opportunity goes bust and does terribly then your money is all locked up in that. Now, it might still be safe, but it might be locked up for ages. It might have been lost in some other transaction. They might have defrauded you and siphoned that money off into something else, right? So you need to be careful of the company. And uh, there was a uh, an example of this fairly recently, okay, uh, called Lendy. Lendy was a property peer-to-peer -peer lending company. It used to produce really, really strong returns. I think it was something like 12%, 12% annual returns. I actually invested in Lendy for a period of time for I think about 18 months. Did really well, got some really strong returns. Uh, fortunately, I uh, divested before the company went bankrupt and because I, I kind of saw signs that it, was, it, was, it wasn't doing so well and um, what, I'd, what I'd feared had actually come true and, and went bankrupt. So you need to be careful, right? Um, these things definitely happen and a lot of people have lost a huge amount of money as a consequence of that company going bankrupt, right? Um, so that's one thing to be mindful of. And then there's the specific things you're investing in, right? So they may say, oh, you're going to get 12% return from the thing you're investing in. But if that thing you, that person who bought a com uh, property, for example, does terribly, loses all their money, okay, it devalues loads, and that's the thing you invest in, then, then you've lost the money, right? Then you've, um, you, your money has gone down in value or you've lost it, okay? There's like a certain personal responsibility in terms of like what it is it specifically you're investing in. And some, some um, platforms allow you to invest in a particular thing. Other platforms allow you to let invest in a more, uh, a bigger kind of portfolio, a bigger like bucket of different stuff. There's all these protections where they say um, they provide a big pot of money on the side so if certain investments go bad, then they fund it out of this side pot, okay? So to protect your money. So there's all these different ones with higher or lower risk. Um, and the ones that have low risk with this side pot of money, they invest only in things that seem to be very safe, you're gonna get a low return. And other ones that give you a high return, that you're investing in specific things, they don't have the same kind of protections, um, they're younger uh, companies, then you're gonna get higher returns, right? And Lendy, for example, high return, 12%, went bankrupt. Okay, so bear that in mind. Okay, so there we have it. We have seven different types of investments. All right, so what do I want to end on here? So we talked about the uh, different types of investments and kind of pros and cons and on what they essentially are. But the, the key thing here is to think, well, based on my situation, what I'm, uh, where I am right now, uh, how long do I want to be investing for? What level of risk do I want to take on? How old am I? Um, what do I understand? Where's my knowledge, my experience in these areas? Where do we feel we're in the market? What do I think is going to do well? 
uh, going forward over the next few years. Based on all of that, what specific investments do I want to invest in? What assets do I want to invest in? Okay, that's a key point. That's your first thing, okay? Once you've got a view on that, you want to start testing it. You want to kind of like DM me, ask me, ask other people you know that you trust in this area. Uh, you can ask, uh, you can research uh, on those particular people. You can follow people that you respect within this area of finance, okay? And start to get a better picture and develop more confidence in the things that you want to be investing in. The second thing is you want to be careful not to invest in just one or two things because if you do that, all your eggs are in one basket. And if you get it wrong and those things devalue, then you're stuck. You kind of lose a lot of money. And I've been there. It sucks, okay? So be careful about doing that. So what I really encourage is this concept of diversification. Uh, so diversifying is investing in a number of different things, okay, that do well or not so well in different situations so that if a certain environment plays out and one thing drops in value it's okay because you have something else that hasn't dropped in value or has actually gone up in value so overall you're doing uh, you're doing still well regardless of the situation that's playing out um, and it's it's called what we call portfolio investing right portfolio investing is essentially you develop a portfolio a, a pot of different things you're investing in now there might be areas that you think are going to particularly do well that you might put more money in, right, that you focus on. Or there might be other areas that you're putting a little bit of money in as a protection and safety, right? And if you've got a particular view of, of, of what's going to do well, then you might focus on those areas. If you don't know, right, you're not very experienced in investing, you might want to take what we call an evergreen approach. An evergreen approach is that regardless of what's going on, economy's doing well, badly, inflation, less inflation, whatever, right? That when you invest in a number of different things together that overall over the medium to long term that pot of money is going to do well and start to increase and grow continuously regardless of the environment over time right now that is the topic for another video um, but that is essentially i'm going to just sow the seed it's called portfolio investing and it's all about finding different things that when you put them together okay then the whole pot will generally go up in value um, over the medium to long term, right? Um, so that uh, so that you can still do well without having all these vol volatility and it still go up in value, all right? And I will cover that off in another video. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and, and share it. Please share it to, to, to those that you think uh, would benefit from it, that you think um, would really uh, wanna know about the information with this video. Um, if uh, you want to give some feedback, if you want to let me know um, uh, what you liked about it, please just put some comments in the um, in the comment section below. If you if you want to let me know about certain topics you want me to talk about going forward, again, let me know about that. I would love to talk about those topics. I want to make sure these videos are as valuable for you as possible. They're targeted for you and um, they're covering the areas that are of most important because that is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to make sure that the people who are watching this, like yourself, uh, are getting the most value from it, okay? So that's it from me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.